Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is obviously the uh, last presentation of the day, so please bear with me. As you can see, the title I've been given is the longest of the day, but my presentation will not be the longest, so don't worry. I would just like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's a great honor for me. And I'd also like to thank Professor Johnson, who was the speaker who was supposed to be here. He couldn't, unfortunately, uh, make his way here, but he did send some valuable input, which I have tried to incorporate into this presentation. He had useful insights. So, uh, Professor Johnson, if you ever watch this online, uh, thank you. So, what I will be focusing on here, even though the title's a bit long, is the war of narratives when we look at countering violent extremism, and more specifically, why the armed forces should play a proactive role in that. Uh, there is a quote that Professor Johnson suggested we start with, and I think I agree because I think it goes to the core of what we've been discussing the entire day here. It's a quote by Napoleon, right? That there are but two powers in the world, the sword and the mind. In the long run, the sword is always beaten by the mind. And I think sort of the discussions that we've had so far sort of reflect that. Now, what is a narrative? A narrative is not something very complex. All it is is a system of stories. And the purpose of a narrative, the function of a narrative, is to give us a coherent, cohesive world view. And narratives often uh, set up patterns that the layman is likely to sort of encounter in day-to-day -day life. So if you set up narratives that are very academic, that are very complex, that doesn't really resonate with the common man, then, of course, you could have those narratives, but they wouldn't really be very successful, particularly in the context of countering extremism. And the most important thing about a narrative is that it allows groups, not just groups, but individuals as well, to interpret and understand the world around them, which is why we need to be so concerned about this. Because when you have a conflict and you have two, uh, when you have two sides, obviously the side that can convince the people that it has legitimacy is the side that has a huge strategic advantage. Now, as far as the insurgent is concerned, their goal, in my judgment, again, you can disagree with me in the Q&A session, my, in my judgment, their goal is singular, which is to resist and outlast the state's uh, will to fight. Of course, they can do this in different ways. They can do this by recruiting more people. They could do this by demoralizing the enemy. They could do this by gaining uh, legitimacy for their own cause. So there are a lot of different ways in which they could do it. But I think the sole function of a narrative from the point of view of an insurgent is this. Uh, and of course, there are various tools that you can exploit, so social grievances, economic and political grievances are the ones that we all know, and, and bigotry as well, particularly in the uh, developing world, even though there are social and political grievances that are often exploited, quite often it's just good old-fashioned bigotry, it's just good old-fashioned prejudice that is the easiest to exploit uh, in, with the people. As far as the state is concerned, of course, we can do this in several ways as well, but in my judgment, the role of the narrative of the state, particularly if we look at the armed forces, is quite singular as well. It is to prevent a civilian, that is a non-combatant, from becoming a combatant. Now, there are various ways in which we can do it, but I think this has to be the singular focus when we look at creating a narrative. Prevent a non-combatant from becoming a combatant. Now, narratives are useful for a lot of different things. So social mobilization, obviously, the people will rally behind you whenever you have a narrative that uh, sort of is very popular with them. The most important function of a narrative is the formation of identities. So this could be your religious identity, your uh, ethnic, uh, linguistic, professional, political identity. But often, the way that you react to certain situations, the way that you uh, pick sides in a conflict will depend on your identity. And your identity is determined by the narratives that are put out there. Uh, motivations for public action, similar to social mobilization. And another important function of narratives in, a, in this context is that the narratives that you put forth will often decide how the public reacts in times of need, how the public reacts in a crisis. Because obviously, when you have your back to the wall, you need the people to more or less uh, listen to your point of view and accept it. So commonly used tactics, uh, uh, referencing some kind of utopia, so this could be some long lost era or some long lost state at some point of time in history, and they tell you that uh, 
sort of we should go back to those roots. It could be a Tamil Elam or a, some kind of caliphate. Or it could be many things, right? So th this whole idea of creating a utopia is often used as a driver of recruitment. Uh, women, so this is just something that I want to touch on. So if you look at ISIS and compare their narratives and the way they use narrative to recruit people, if, if you compare that with some of their rivals, like let's say Al-Qaeda now, one frightening trend that seems to be gaining a lot of success is the use of women in the narrative for recruitment. And what I mean by that is you are told that you can have sex slaves. You are told that uh, you can sort of own women. And often many of these organizations appeal to the basest instincts in young men, particularly unemployed young men, and particularly unemployed young men in very conservative societies. So I think that's something we need to keep in mind. Uh, the most commonly used line, of course, is that you have been wronged. You are told that uh, you've been cheated in some way, some injustice has been done to you in some way, and that you either need to mobilize uh, for revenge or for justice or to make sure this doesn't happen again or something like that. And finally, obviously, discontent with the establishment. Now, what do you require to create narratives? Number one, you need credibility. Now, from the perspective of the armed forces, often the antagonistic uh, sort of uh, relationship is between the narrative of the armed forces and the narrative of uh, civil society. You can't really blame either. I often see members of civil society getting angry with the armed forces and members of the armed forces getting angry with civil society. It's just the nature of these two entities, right, that they have opposing uh, worldviews and they have opposing uh, narratives. Reach. Now, one thing, of course, uh, during one of the earlier presentations, uh, the WWF was brought up, right? Professional wrestling was brought up, of course, in a completely different context, but an analogy came to my mind, which I think is very important here. Now, I was just a little boy when the first Gulf War uh, broke out. I couldn't tell you where the United States was. I couldn't tell you where Iraq was. I couldn't tell you where Kuwait was. But if you asked me, if you asked my brother, who's the same age, if you asked any of our little friends at that time who the good guys were and who the bad guys were, we would have said, without a moment's hesitation. Of course, the good guys are the United States and the bad guys are Iraq. The bad, Saddam Hussein is the bad guy. Of course, we knew nothing, as I said, but we knew that when we switched on television, let's say we watched uh, something like pro wrestling, right? Hulk Hogan was the good guy who represented the American side, and I don't know, I guess the Iron Sheik or Sergeant Slaughter would be the bad guys because they represented the Iraqi side. Now, that might be a silly analogy to some, but I think that's important. Why? Because even in our little corner of South Asia, these young boys who know nothing about politics, who know nothing about warfare, the American narrative reached us. That is the power of a narrative that reaches people because it could, it could sort of have global consequences and many of us grow up with that worldview, right? So it often sort of has long-term uh, repercussions. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the Iraqi armed forces. What can you do against a PR machine uh, that big. Sometimes I think the answer is no. For many of these things, if you cannot, if your adversary is so much ahead of you in one of these things that you just can't bridge that gap, then you're, you're probably in a lot of trouble. Uh, Mark, I use the word marketing quite uh, facetiously. What I mean is clarity, right? You need a clear narrative that you push to the people. It has to resonate with the people. You could have reach, you could have credibility, but if your message is muddled, then it will do you no good. Uh, and you need public engagement as well. It's not just enough if we tell the people what we believe and if we spin a narrative for the people. We need to make them feel like they were a part of this. We need to make them feel like uh, that this is their narrative. And I think that is a sort of key to success. A counter narrative is something that we, that we just do to counter uh, someone else's narrative. Now, what, Something that was brought up earlier was the identification of at-risk populations. I think that's very important. So if you want to be good at weaving counter-narratives, you have to be good at identifying uh, at-risk uh, segments. And you must also have a positive impact on those uh, at-risk segments. I think uh, General Mehta in the uh, Q&A session, the first one uh, sort of suggested, made a very interesting observation that countering violent extremism is non-coercive. And I would agree with that, and I would add one more aspect to it. I think it has to be positive on the segment that you target, because if not, you are very unlikely, in my judgment, to make real progress. It's also a great way to engage with and learn about the adversary. Now, often I think when we weave, uh, weave narratives, we miss this out. Before I was a 
research fellow for the BCIS. Uh, uh, many years ago, I was doing my postgraduate diploma in international relations then. Our chairperson, Mr. Palito Fernando, was our lecturer for international law. And one thing he would often emphasize with us was the need for engagement. The need to know how to get your point of view across in the international arena. Because if you don't care about effectively establishing your position, why should anyone else? And finally, this might again be something that you disagree with, but I think the primary purpose of narrative and counter-narrative from the point of view of the armed forces, sh it shouldn't be to reconvert the converted. If someone has already been radicalized and your counter-narrative uh, sort of uh, infrastructure gets them back in the, in, in the fold, that's well and good, but I, I, don't think that could, I don't think it's sustainable for us to have that as our primary focus. I think our primary focus should always be on making sure that the unconverted stay unconverted, that they don't, that they don't get converted or radicalized into a cause. As I said, de-radicalization is important, but I think our, our, our primary focus has to be purely on making sure that we don't add to the numbers of the adversary. Now, why the armed forces? Because when you look at the things that you need to weave a, a proper narrative, in many countries, the armed forces might be one of the only institutions that fulfills all those, that has credibility, that has uh, reach, that can weave a message that resonates with the public. Now, we have uh, uh, friends from uh, many different countries. Now, in all your countries, how many institutions could you say fulfill all those requirements? Uh, in, in, in many parts of the world, the answer might perhaps be not many. It's still what I like to call a revered manifestation of the state. So we see lots of manifestations of the state, but do most of them enjoy the sort of a position that the armed forces do? Highly unlikely. And you, when I mean you, the armed forces obviously, are also directly involved in the consequences of these political narratives because you are the ones who are expected to be on the front lines. Therefore, it only makes sense that uh, you have a more than average say in how these things are done. And of course, every success, I like to say, results in one less adversary. So that's one less person whom you might have to kill someday or one less person who might want to kill you someday. And I think that's a huge difference when you look at that dynamic. What are the hallmarks of a good narrative, right? So it has to be crafted, again, in my judgment, I agree that uh, sort of it's, it can't be a military strategy. It has to be non-coercive and it has to be sort of harmonious. But at the same time, I think we do need to acknowledge that there's a lot of synergy between military operations and informational operations. And the more we exploit that, I think the more successful we will be. We also need to take into account the enemy's propaganda. If we exist in a vacuum, then in certain cases, in certain scenarios, that might work. But we do need to consider what the adversary says in order for us to have a better idea of what we need to say. Uh, a good narrative, a good counter-narrative would be a global narrative, particularly in, in, in today's world, right? So if you put something out there, you can't really expect it to exist, as I said, in a bubble. You will face lots of case, uh, situations where that spirals out of your borders and it will have an impact that sort of transcends your boundaries. And finally, again, you might disagree with this, but I think the sort of purpose of a narrative is to affect interpretation is to affect the way that people understand and perceive things. It's not to create new facts. Sometimes when we look at uh, sort of uh, the state missionary trying to weave new narratives, they focus on pushing new facts out there rather than simply trying to manipulate what the people already believed and doing it in a more subtle way. I think that would be a lot more useful in today's world. Now, I'll just quickly run through the limitations as well. There are, of course, many limitations that we need to think about. Number one is that it's a long process that can't be quantified. So you might get a few numbers, like, like uh, social media numbers, how many people attend your awareness programs and things like that. But you can never really quantify beyond a certain level of accuracy if you're being successful or not. It's just one of those things where you have to wait and see in many cases. Events don't really unfold as planned. So I like to use the word organic. It has to be a living, breathing thing. Because if it's inflexible and dead, what do you do when something goes wrong? You're stuck. Uh, we also need to remember that a change of attitudes will not always result in a change of behavior. I mean, how many insurgencies have we all seen where the insurgents have uh, lost public support a long, long time ago, where even the local people that they cl claim to protect does not really support them, and yet the insurgency lasts for a long time even after that because 
attitude changes do not necessarily translate on a macro scale to behavioral changes. And finally, and uh, Mr. Palto Fernando and I were discussing this, I think in some cases there is an inherently antagonistic relationship between combatants and non-combatants, right? As in, there is inherently, even though we might like to feel that we can bridge the gap, even though we might like to feel that there is middle ground, tangible middle ground that we can all have a sustainable long-term strategy on, sometimes I wonder, and I could be wrong, I wonder if the worldview of people who have seen the reality of war will ever be compatible with the worldview of, uh, worldview of people who haven't. Right, I think that, I mean, it's, it's a troubling question, but I think that's something we need to consider. Final slide, causation is complicated. We saw some of the previous speakers touch on this as well. Simply because we interpret something to be because of a certain cause, simply because we interpret violent uh, insurrections and violent extremism to be because of a certain thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that our interpretation is true because our interpretation could be wrong as well. So we need to keep that in mind and that is certainly a limitation of sort of pushing a long-term effective strategy. Technological imbalances, right? Now how many states across the world can compete with many of the most sophisticated online cyber non-state actors in the world? We had a presentation on this uh, just before me and I think that really sort of emphasized the difference sometimes. Non-state actors today are very capable of spreading their story out there, of controlling their narrative. The state no longer has a monopoly over what you're told. The state no longer has a monopoly over what you're allowed to think. And finally, uh, it takes years to build credibility, but only one mistake to destroy, right? So we could have all these things that last a long, long time, but one small mistake could be fatal. And on that pessimistic note, well, reasonably pessimistic, we did have some speakers ending on there's no light at the end of this tunnel, so it's quite optimistic compared to that. So on that note, have a great day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.